All right, welcome to another exciting episode of Advanced Level Chemistry here at Spain Park. Today is Friday, September the 27th, and it's game day. It's also hurricane day, and it's also chemistry fun day. So we're going to just kind of be talking about how to initiate and control chemical reactions. Uh, continue on in the notes. But before we go there, your labs are going to be due on Monday. Does anybody have a question, any questions about the expectation of this lab? Okay. The most important part is going to be your answers to this part of the lab sheet. You got your, you're going to turn in your two data pages, the A and the B, and then you have the questions on the back as well. But the majority of the, the whole purpose of the lab is for you to tell whether it's a physical change or a chemical change. And it's going to be essential that you give evidence-based reasoning for your conclusion. And the evidence has to be listed in your observations on either part A or part B. So you can't just make up some random stuff that came out of the notes or something that you read out of the book or something that you looked up online. It needs to be something that you have written in your observations on part A or part B. Again. I've been giving you the reason, we talked about the iron and sulfur. Was the iron and sulfur a physical change or a chemical change? Physical. Physical. Okay, so you circle physical. But then it would be nice if you said it's a physical change because, how did you know it's a physical change? Based upon the things that we observed. Just give me two reasons. Uh, the iron kept its like mag mag magnetism. The iron kept its magnetic characteristic. Okay, so in other words, if it's a physical change, they retain their individual characteristics, right? So you could say it's a physical change because, uh, for one, uh, they maintain their physical characteristics, such as iron remained magnetic, magnetic and sulfur did not. What other physical characteristic did, it, did they maintain? Uh, their colors. Their color. The sulfur stayed yellow, the iron stayed that reddish brown. Okay. Were there any evidence of a chemical change when you mix those? No. No. Okay. So uh, that could be another. There was no evidence of a chemical change, such as no heat, no smoke, no light was given off. Okay. So though that's kind of what you're supposed to put, kind of all in that. Now I know a lot of y'all did bullet points on that, and that's really probably the more efficient way because I didn't really give you enough space to write, you know, two or three full sentences on that. But just make sure that you're putting a good deal of evidence from what you observed to back up your claim, okay? That's the whole purpose of that. So that's gonna be due on Monday. It should just be about done, all right? And don't forget there's questions on the back, so you gotta answer the few questions on the back as well. This is advanced level chemistry. I'm expecting advanced level work. And please write it in such a way I can read it. So take your time, make sure. <laughs> You're writing legibly. All right, so now let's go back. Let's go back and make sure on a couple of things on the notes. Okay? We talked about physical and chemical changes, but we didn't really talk about these two terms about physical and chemical changes. So let's look at your notes. Does everybody, I don't see any, the, the excitement here is overwhelming in, in the class. You guys got to get fired up a little bit. So when we talk about a physical property, you read about this, they defined it in the book, so I'm hopefully, you, I mean, and you did learn this in eighth grade, so this is a review. This is just on, uh, this is the page before evidence of a chemical change. It's a quality or something you can tell about a piece of paper, about something. What, what can I tell about this piece of paper without changing it? It's white. It's white, it's, so it's color. It's flat, kind of its shape. We can say it's rectangular. It's got black writing on it, okay? We can measure, you know, how much it weighed. We can measure the length, the width, and the height. All of these are physical properties. Anything I can determine about this. Did we determine the density of the alcohol without changing the alcohol? Yes, yes no? Yeah. We did, right? We did three, five, seven, nine, then we kind of just poured it right back in, right? It didn't change anything. 
Can you determine the temperature without changing the identity? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So and all of those are physical properties. But what about, will the paper burn? Does, is paper flammable? Yes. How, how do we know? You have to light it on fire, right? To find out. If it, if it lights on fire, it's flammable. So in order to determine a chemical property, you, you have to kind of make it do the chemical reaction. You got to find out, does it do what, does it react with an acid? I don't know, maybe put some acid on it. Okay? You've got to have to make it go through a chemical change. You've got to make it change somehow to determine it. Chemical properties describe the ability to what, what chemical reactions will they do. So chemical properties, chemical reactions are really kind of tied together. The chemical property is, describes what chemical reactions they'll do. But when we come back up in here, there are two types, though, of those physical properties of all the ones that we, I just kind of went through and we talked about. Which ones depend upon how much stuff you have? Does the boiling point of water matter if you have a cup of water or a gallon of water? No. no. What about the freezing point? No. No. They're going to freeze at zero degrees Celsius whether you have a cup or a gallon. What else can you determine about a cup of water or a gallon of water that would be the same for both? And these are things to go ahead and don't just sit there, but let's go ahead and put examples down as, as we talk about these. What are some of the things you can tell about a cup of water or a gallon of water that would not change from a cup to a gallon? The density of water. The density of the water. Okay? Density is going to be the same. Color. The color. The taste. The taste, although we never, ever, 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 ever use the taste test in chemistry. It's just not a good practice. <laughs> <laughs> the odor. The odor. Now, with it, it might be a little bit stronger, but it's still going to have the same odor. So, anything that you can determine about a substance without changing its, you know, it doesn't matter how much. Now, what are some things that would depend upon how much you have? Weight. Obviously, the weight or the mass. Uh, volume. The volume, how much space it takes up. The length, the width, the height, okay? Anything that is really dependent upon how much is there is going to be an extensive property. Now, if I just said I had five grams of a substance, would that really help me know what the substance is? But if I know the melting point, I know the boiling point, I know the density of it, that's really gonna help me identify, close in on what the substance might be. Okay, so intensive properties are much more helpful in being I, helping identify the substance because those are more intensive. They're they're more internal. They're more just descriptive. They're more identifying what it is. Intensive. They're internal. They don't change based upon the amount. Okay, so we have physical properties and chemical properties, but we need to be able to differentiate between intensive and extensive. Did we really measure any extensive properties in this particular lab that we that you're about to turn in? No. Everything was intensive, wasn't it? Because mm -hmm. we wanted to know were any of those things changing. All right, so that's that. And you already, we, we looked up at this as far as uh, changes. The only thing I want to just kind of do here is what do we call the big numbers out in front in a chemical reaction? Coefficients. Coefficients. What do we call the little numbers down here? Just same as in math. Exponents will be up. Really? These little these little numbers? There you go, whoever just said it. Subscripts. It's a subscript. So then we look and say, okay, well, what's the difference then between um, 2H versus H2? Go ahead, Michael. Well, there'd be two H's in the first one. Okay, so they're going to have an H, and they're going to have another H. Are they going to be bonded together? No. No. What about H2? Two H's are bonded together. It's going to be an H1 molecule where they're bonded together. So two out in front means I have two individual of whatever that is. If it's a subscript, that's going to imply it's bonded together. Y'all see the difference? You guys just... 
low energy coming through today. It's Friday. You guys done it early. Get fired up here. Get fired up. All right. So, hey, by the way, typo right here. Typo. This is supposed to be a subscript. H2O. It's supposed to be a subscript. So what's the law of conservation of mass say then? Matter can either be created or destroyed. So when we have an equation like this, we had to balance the equation with the coefficient because we had to make sure that we have four hydrogens here, we have to have four hydrogens here. Two oxygens here, we have to have two oxygens over there as well. You have to have the same number of atoms. Atoms in a chemical reaction, you have the same number on the product side as you did on the reactant side. That's why we have to balance the chemical equation. We'll do a lot of that later on in life. Okay, so let's get to the fun part. We already talked about these evidences of a chemical change. What's the definition of a precipitate again? Um, it's like a, a solid that forms. From a, a solid that forms in a chemical reaction. So we did those reactions yesterday. And again, if you look at this, okay, I'll stay over here so people can see it. When you look at this, Can you see the red down here at the bottom? So what type of mixture was it when it was all mixed together yesterday? Suspension. It was a suspension. Okay. How do you know? No, there's a couple of ways. How do we know it's a suspension? Because gravity forced it. It settled out due to gravity is one thing. So solutions, the yellow didn't settle out due to gravity. It was... Um it wasn't translucent. It, was it wasn't, clear. you couldn't see through it, it wasn't clear. It was cloudy, right? As soon as you mix things together, if it goes from clear, not necessarily colorless, but clear, to cloudy, that means that you got big particles dissolved, it's gonna be a suspension and not a solution. So the yellow is still a solution, but the, the red that was mixed in, it was a suspension, it settled out. I can collect the red by filtration. I can't collect the yellow by filtration. Those particles are too small. Okay, so we have those characteristics. Now, let's talk about what are the different ways we can start a chemical reaction, a chemical change. Okay, so everybody get your notes out and let, let's look at here. I'm going to give you some examples of how to do this. All right. The first thing that we do to initiate a chemical reaction is obviously we can add heat. Okay. If I want paper and oxygen want to burn, okay. if I want to initiate, I want to make this reaction occur, actually if I want to make it occur faster, I can increase the temperature, I can increase the heat. The reality is, is this paper right now is burning. Okay, It's burning. It doesn't look like it's burning, but it's burning just ever so slowly. How do I know that? Here is my college, freshman college binder, notebook, okay? 1978, 1979, okay? So if I go and I look at this, let me see, let me get a good one here. Oh, this is good. Diode and transistor characteristics, December 2nd, 1980, okay? Doesn't it look like it's been in a fire? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it's just been sitting in my closet for a very, very long time. <laughs> okay, with the oxygen atoms hitting it, and ever so often there's enough. It's just so this this paper looked like this paper when I did it. It's just slowly burning. Okay? Now, here's just a little history for you. <laughs> this was um, Antigone. This was my Freshman English, this was second semester of freshman year, April 17th, 1979. When I was in college, we didn't have computers. We didn't have laptops, we didn't have desktops. We typed on a typewriter. Actually, I didn't type. A girlfriend of mine typed, okay? Because I didn't know how to type. Um, but I offered to buy her lunch at the cafeteria where we had the meal plan already paid for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was broke. <laughs> But this is kind of, it's weird, it's called typing paper. It's kind of really weird. 
typo paper. I don't know why they made us type on that, but this is this is how we had to do our papers. And then if you made a mistake, you just had to either use white out or sometimes the typewriter had a backspace so it automatically why you back it out and you hit the same letter and hold a button and it would put white out just on the letter and then you could retype on it. Okay, but it, you, you couldn't just go and type fast and mess up. Okay, so it was really um, not fun, very tedious. Um, and so, uh, but you can see it's just, and this was white like this as well when, when um, I typed, well, when she typed on it. Okay, Antigone, what I, does, it, does it give me a score? 46 out of 50, not bad for me in English. Okay, I'll take it. I think I got that one just there. <laughs> Did you guys have to read Antigone? Yeah, last Okay, year. Antigone. And so, um, yeah, I think I, I think I used my high school paper and turned it in in college. It's not plagiarism because it was mine, but I did it in high school and I just used it again in college, you know? Um, you know, so, uh, hey, why reinvent the wheel, wheel if they're gonna make you do the same thing in college? Uh, I'll, I think I got a, probably got a better grade in high school because I graded easier, but um, anyway. So the paper's burning. So if I want to though speed it up, speed up the process, I just take a match and I can light it. Okay, so now I'm initiating the chemical reaction. I'm just giving it a lot of heat and the heat is speeding up the reaction, okay? This is the, yeah, this is a copy of your lab report here, okay? And so that yeah, adding heat will initiate, that's the most common way we make something to go. You know, we light the fuse. We did start the fire and it causes the reaction to occur. Second way we can initiate a reaction is with light. I have some hydrogen peroxide right here, okay? We have hydrogen peroxide, but it's always stored in these opaque bottles. You, most of the time the stuff you get is in a brown bottle, the amber bottle. And it says store in a cool, dark place. Because hydrogen peroxide, does anybody remember the formula of hydrogen peroxide? H2O2. H2O2. And it's an aqueous solution. And it will decompose all on its own into water and oxygen. And that's going to be a gas. It always says store in a cool, dark place. Now, first off, we need to balance this equation, okay? Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two oxygens, but I have three oxygens. Anyone? Um, put a two in front of the um, H2O2 on the front and then put a two in front of the H2O on the... Okay, now how did you know to do that? Um. Because in order to have an even amount, you need to make it, uh, you have to um, double the one on that side or triple it, depending on how high okay. you go. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, just okay, so double. look, we, is anything times two ever going to be an odd number? So I have two plus one is three over here. So I have to get the right side to be an even number of some kind in order for the left side to even have a chance. So then you start working your way up the numbers. So I know I can start with a two right there to now give me four oxygens. So I can put a two right there to give me four oxygens, but that gives me four hydrogens, and look at there, four hydrogen. So just kind of look and try and see. If you have odd on one side, even on the other, you gotta get them both even, because you're never gonna get, you're never gonna get the even side odd, but you can get the odd side even, okay? All right, so this reaction just takes place just being exposed to the light. It initiates the reaction. Remember I put the, the, the white silver chloride precipitate outside the magic window of science yesterday? And it kind of turned the purplish gray? That was a light initiated chemical reaction. And we talked about that thing called photographic film. Light initiates many chemical reactions, okay? So where's the best place to store peroxide, you think? Cabinet. Under the sink is where most of us do because it's dark at least and you got the amber bottle. But is under the sink cool? No. In a fridge? You really want to store it in the fridge. 
assuming that the light really does go off when you close the door. Okay? And again, I used to as a kid. I, my, my parents would get mad at me for you know, playing in the fridge. You know? So if you just stretch it, you got a question. You just, just stretch. Uh, that's fine. You can do it. I just want to make sure I'm not ignoring you. Okay? So light initiates many chemical reactions. Light initiates the tanning of your skin. Okay? In, in the summertime, I get very, very dark. Okay? And so the sun initiates that change in our skin. Uh, to, you know, it's light initiated. Now, electricity, putting electricity, it causes many chemical reactions. And this is, this, uh, that's interesting that that did that. This is supposed to be H2O2 right there. I don't know if yours it looks like mine on this, but that's supposed to be, uh, actually it's supposed to be H2O, the decomposition of water, H2O. All right? And I, I happen to have some water right here hooked up to some electricity, okay? So I have, this is, this is uh, you know, it generates a direct current. It's kind of like hooking it up to a battery, okay? And I have the electrodes here. It didn't work for the longest time in the first period until I realized that I didn't have it plugged in, which is why I'm videoing this class, and I had a video on that one, but I didn't want that one uh, <laughs> to go out to kind of show my buffoonness. Oh, I, you got to plug it in for it to work. <laughs> okay, so I am going to, though, go safety first, even though there's not a whole lot that's going to go on here. But we have water. I have water all inside of here, okay? Poured some water in. And now I'm going to hook up the electricity. And when I turn on the electricity, can y'all out everywhere, can you see what's happening? Can the back row, can you see bubbles forming at all? Okay? If you want to get out of your seat and come closer, you can come look. Or you can just trust me that there's bubbles being formed. Okay? So... The electricity is going in, and what's happening when I'm putting the electricity in? What does it mean, the electrolysis, the decomposition of water, H2O? If water is decomposed, what is it decomposing into? Hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, Michael said over here, somebody in the back, what's it decomposing into? Hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, I was said somebody, I said you already said it, somebody over here. Okay, but he said hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? Now, it's kind of in a race right now, and at the beginning you can't hardly see, but this side is coming down faster than this side. So which, which gas do you think is being collected on this side versus this side? Hydrogen on the right. Okay? Which one? Hydrogen. Hydrogen on the right. Why somebody else? These two up here are answering everything. Everybody else is just kind of looking around. Why would this be the hydrogen one? This is a gas over here too. What's the formula of water? H2O. H2O. Okay. So why why is this one going down faster? There's more hydrogen, and it, and if it's working right, we should have right at about a two to one ratio of the gases being produced. Okay. Now there's another way we can prove that this is hydrogen. Now, did, some, did I come around on some of y'all when we were doing the lab and you're doing the magnesium and the HCl, did I come around and light some of the gas when it was bubbling? Yeah. Did I light any of y'all's gases? Okay, no? Okay. Well, I can take this right here. This is just take a test tube and I'll let this gas come out. Okay, so now it's kind of full of gas. Now, hydrogen is very light, so it doesn't escape so when I go and I light it, okay, did you hear that? That's called a test tube bark, okay? That was, that was the hydrogen gas. Now, why do you think it made a noise? Uh, can you do that again? I got that some collect. Okay, because why? It was escaping, but those of you, anybody, uh, you're in the band, but anybody like play the trumpet or flute or any, any brass or woodwind? How do they make a noise? Air. Air blowing through the tube, right? So what happens when this gas lights? It speeds up. 
It gets real hot, right? And the gas expands quickly into the tube, and it's just, just like an instrument. It's the, as it expands through the tube, okay, it makes the noise. I'm not sure if that's enough. Well, watch this one now. So this is oxygen. I need a, I need a volunteer. Let me have a, come on, Mars. <laughs> okay, I need you to light this flint with this. You can do the lighter, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You're going you're gonna to hold the splint too. Okay. okay, so just light the splint. Okay, and try to keep it lit. Okay, there you go. Now, do, and if you need to turn it sideways. So now, what gas is this one supposedly? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? So now I'm going to collect the oxygen into this test tube. Okay, now you can uh, blow the splint. Just blow the splint out. Yeah, I'll do it. Here, now watch. I tap the splint out and I put it down into here and it burst back into flames. Okay, well, it only had enough oxygen to do it once. Why do you think it burned back, burst back into flames? Oxygen fuels fine. Because it's pure oxygen, so things burn faster in the pure oxygen than they do just in air. What's, what's the percent of oxygen in the air? Okay, do what? No. It's like it's very low, right? Very Pretty low. Now it's higher than 12. 30. It's less than 30. Right at 20, 21%. What's the, what's the most of it? Nitrogen. 78% nitrogen, 21%. Your, your, your battery is like, yeah, has the thing. It's, the thing. it's still recording though. Okay. This should be all right. Okay. All right. So let's just do this one again. Okay. This is, Michael wanted to see this one again. Just get everything out of there. So collect the hydrogen. Now I can just keep it upside down because hydrogen is lighter than air. Go ahead and light it. Okay. okay. And so, hey, by the way, never, ever, ever hold a test tube in your hand when you're doing a chemical reaction. Okay? Never do that. All right. So we can see that electricity initiates a chemical reaction. Another thing that initiates a chemical reaction is sometimes just putting it in water. I have an Alka-Seltzer tablet, okay? I have an Alka-Seltzer tablet. Now notice it's in this wax paper to keep it dry, and this is a powdered solid. But everything that needs to react is right here in this, ready to react, okay? But it's not reacting, why not? Because compounds, when they're in the solid state, they're all locked and bonded to one another real tightly. So even though this wants to go with something else, say like, you know, it's not water, but it just wants to combine with, say, with this, if this is held tightly and this is held tightly, they can't rearrange, they can't, they can't mingle and mix. But when you put the, the compounds into water, it breaks them apart and the water surrounds them. So now they're no longer locked into this relationship, but into this chemical bond. Now they get mobility. The blue can separate and get surrounded as well. Get it all on there. Okay. And so now, so now they're floating around. Now they can mix with who, whatever they want to mix with. So you have citric acid in here. Okay, that's just, you know, like from fruit and things. And sodium bicarbonate. This is very similar to what we did when we put the HCl into the baking soda. However, we don't want to eat or drink HCl. Citric acid is a lot weaker acid and it's, and it's better for you. And so right here in Alka-Seltzer, there's not two coming to pack it. So they always say plop, plop, fizz, fizz. So you go plop, plop, fizz, fizz. So immediately, now what do we begin to see? You see bubbles, right? What's that an indication? A chemical reaction is taking place. Okay? And this is the, the, the acetic acid is reacting with the sodium bicarbonate, making that CO2 gas just like the HCl did when you put it on the baking soda. And now you would drink this if you had upset stomach, if not too much stomach acid. The commercials when I was growing up is some big old guy like me would just come in, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. And so now he's got all kinds of acid indigestion because he just, you know, gorged himself on a pizza or something. 
And so you would drink this to kind of help get rid of that acid indigestion. Um, so Alka-Seltzer, so plop, plop, fizz, fizz. So uh, many, many, many reactions have to take place in water in solutions. You've got to dissolve it and make a solution so the ions can move around and react with one another. So a lot of things won't mix the solids. You've got to, water is the great dance floor for chemical reactions to take place. Okay? And lastly, what's a catalyst do? Speeds up. But notice it, this is key. Maybe underline this. Without changing itself. Without changing itself. So we, we've seen this one before. Okay? Does everybody, everybody has that? Without changing itself. So we have the peroxide reaction right here. So when I take this peroxide, and I go and I pour it in, Ooh, a little bit more than I needed. I pour that in. It's decomposing right now. But it's not very exciting, is it? It's not very fast, is it? Okay. What, are we having issues? <laughs> I just gotta close this notification. It's really annoying me. There we go. Okay. Having te technical difficulties here, but hopefully the battery's gonna last. But if I add a catalyst, I can speed up this reaction. So I'm, you guys have seen this before, the good classic elephant toothpaste. Okay. But I put some color in here just to make it pretty. Okay. Put a little blue, put a little green. Put a little, I don't know, is this yellow? Is it orange? I'm not sure what color this is. I think it's yellow. Okay? But still not reacting, so we need to speed this up. So I'm going to take some potassium iodide. Okay? Just a solid. I'm just going to put some potassium iodide into here. And now, all of a sudden, the reaction is going to take place much, much, much faster. It's supposed to look like elephant toothpaste, a too big toothpaste, toothpaste fit for an elephant. Okay? Now, because it's steaming, what do you think that means in terms of temperature? It's hot. So is it endo or exothermic? Exothermic. Exothermic. Okay? Is there evidence that a chemical change is taking place? Okay? It's going pretty, cr pretty crazy. Okay? Okay? Oh, it's leaking. That's all right. Is it hot? <laughs> no. It's hot. I mean, it's warm. That part's warm. But I mean, if I would try to touch the uh, the graduated cylinder or the cylinder, it's not graduated. Just uh, it's very hot. It's too hot to touch. Okay. So it's an exothermic reaction. Now, what do you think? Again, why? Why did it bubble? I was producing gas. Okay. Somebody else. What gas? Hydrogen. Hydrogen gas is being produced? Oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is being produced. It's being produced very rapidly. That's why, Sophie, we're paying attention to me up here. Okay. That's why, okay, yeah, well, I had to put the soap in there, the dishwashing detergent, the, 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 the dishwashing detergent, because, um, Otherwise, it just kind of would bubble it down at the bottom. The, the, the dishwashing detergent is what makes the, um, the rapid release of the oxygen makes the bubbles and makes it look fun. Okay? So we're just making a creative reaction. Now, where if a catalyst doesn't change itself, how do I put it into the equation? The arrow. What about it? The arrow. What about the arrow? You put it on the arrow, that's exactly right. So when you see a compound on the arrow like that, that's gonna be an indication that it's a catalyst. Now I strongly recommend that even right there underneath that, you write this equation and put that in, and you say that this is the catalyst, okay? That's called taking notes. That's called paying attention to what's going on in the class and participating and not just sitting there saying, oh God, how many more minutes, okay?
anytime you have a substance on top of the air. So now theoretically, I could extract the same amount of Ki. Now the Ki dissolved in the water that was in there and so it would be hard to get the Ki out. The heat from the reaction actually caused some of the Ki to decompose. So the yellow color, the dark yellow color is actually iodine that's being produced. Okay, so the catalyst bed sometimes um, uh, decays. In your car, you have a catalytic converter. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever heard that term before or not. A catalytic converter. It's part of your exhaust system. And in that catalytic converter, they have expensive metals. Uh, I know back in the day, they had platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Okay? But they're all expensive metals. And there's a big problem now that we have SUVs that sit up high. Now, you know, you park your car at the mall. Thieves have come in and just with a, um, a quick sawzall, they can just slide under your car without even using a jack, cut out the catalytic converter and take it and totally mess up your exhaust system. And then they get the metals out of it and take it to recycle and get money and go buy their drugs. And so uh, that, that's actually, I mean, a, a major issue. Now they're trying to cut down at the recyclers. They've got to prove where they get the metals from and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, it is a big issue with catalytic converters being stolen. If you ever look it up in the news, it, it's a news story about every six months or so. Um, and it's just because it, it's so quick and so easy for them to get to. So the catalytic converter in your car, we talked about carbon monoxide being dangerous for you. Well, your car exhaust sometimes has carbon monoxide. Well, as it goes over the catalyst bed, it's supposed to speed up the reaction of changing carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. And so it comes out in carbon dioxide is much less uh, dangerous to you health-wise. So that's what a catalyst does. Now you may sometimes, above an arrow, above an arrow, you might sometimes see if it just said light. That means we might have to just add some light to it to cause it to react. If, you know, sometimes it just does this and a little triangle, that's going to mean heat is added. This is this is a non-artist chemist fire, flame, little triangle. That just means heat. So those are the conditions that are needed for the chemical reaction, the chemical change to take place. Let's see if I can make it. Oh, it. All right, so there are five ways in which we can initiate. Now, it's very important. A catalyst will not cause a reaction to occur that doesn't already occur. It only speeds it up, okay? Heat. Heat is the only one that does both. Light initiates, water initiates, electricity initiates, heat initiates and controls, makes it go faster or slower, and a catalyst only makes it go faster. What would be the opposite of a catalyst? I don't know if you learned this in biology or not, what enzymes do in your body to... If a catalyst speeds up a reaction, what would the opposite be? Slow it down. Something that slows down. Do you know anything in your body that slows down a reaction? Make your biology teachers proud, come on. No? You got enzymes in your, in your blood, in your body, that slow the oxidation process, they slow the aging process down. Okay, there's some people that have that disease where they age super fast, faster than they're supposed to because they don't have that inhibitor to inhibit that aging process. And so the, you know, those people that are searching for the fountain of youth, they're looking for some kind of inhibitor. Now, nitrogen in the air is an inhibitor. This paper would have just burst into flames, just like the, the splint, wherever the splint, it burst into flames in pure oxygen. It was barely glowing in air, but in the pure oxygen, it burst into flames. Things burn way more quickly. Um, have you ever seen in the movies where somebody's maybe in an oxygen tent, you know, and they, they uh, you know, just, they always worry about no smoking or you just, whatever. It's not that the oxygen itself is flammable. It's just in that pure oxygen environment, everything else is going to burn way, way faster. So if you, you know, were trying to smoke a cigarette inside of an oxygen tent, 
Um, the cigarette's gonna burn super fast. The sheet would catch on fire very fast. You would catch on fire very fast. The oxygen's not gonna explode. It's just gonna cause everything to burn super fast. The greater the concentration of oxygen, the faster the reaction's gonna go. All right, so those are ways to initiate a chemical reaction. Now I need to look at your notes. Your notes are like mine. They just stop right here, right? Okay. I'm going to add in, but I'm probably going to wait until um, Monday to add in. But let's just talk real quickly then about this last little bit. Your phone's about to die. Uh. You can plug it up to charge. change or a physical change it could be a nuclear change so we're going to go after this unit we're going to go and study the atom okay you gotta open it up <laughs> you can do it you can do it come on done done we're going to study what makes things radioactive what happens in a nuclear change in a nuclear change, it's any change, obviously, in the nucleus. But it changes the identity of the atom. This is what uh, the alchemists were trying to do back in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. They were trying to change common metals into gold. But that would require a nuclear change. They didn't know how to do that. Ordinary chemical changes aren't going to change the identity. They just swap them. A nuclear change changes the identity completely. I kind of look at it like this. A physical change is you just getting new clothes, maybe getting your hair fixed differently, putting on makeup. You're just changing the outside, but you're still the same person as you always were. A chemical change is one in which you change your friends. You change who you're hanging out with, okay? So London is just you know hanging out with purity, but then goes through a chemical change and then starts hanging out with Mars. Okay, Re just rearrange. She's still the same person, just ch hanging out, changing who she's hanging out with. Their atoms are rearranging with one another, but they're still the same atoms. They're not changing at all. A nuclear change is when you have that epiphany, that Scrooge moment, to where, oh, all of a sudden, you're changing. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You've changed who you are. You're a new creation. That's a nuclear change. When the atoms change, when, when uranium undergoes nuclear decay, when it gives off an alpha particle, has a nuclear reaction, uranium is actually changed into thorium. It's no longer uranium. It changes the identity. When carbon-14, which they use radioactive carbon dating, when it changes, it actually becomes nitrogen. And so it changes completely. So a nuclear change changes the identity and it's almost always going to involve radioactivity which we're going to study, uh, not next unit but the next one and we're going to learn all about it. Nuclear power plants, atomic bombs, they all involve nuclear changes, not ordinary chemical reactions. And then lastly, if something isn't matter, it's energy and there's just all different types of energy. Uh, and you can just kind of look at all these different things. We've talked about potential and kinetic, all these different things. But here's something that you need to know right here. In a nuclear reaction, mass is converted into energy e equals mc squared. E equals mc squared. Does anybody know what these letters stand for? Energy equals mass. This is energy. E equals energy. What does M stand for? Mass. Mass. And what's the SI unit of mass? What unit does it have to be in? Grams. No, kilograms. Kilograms. 
and C. No, that, that it does stand for specific heat, but in this case it doesn't. C is used a bunch. Nobody? It's the speed of light. It's the relationship between mass and energy. This is the crossover. We're going to get more into detail in that as we go throughout the semester. But the speed of light, does anybody know what the speed of light is? No. It is very fast. Okay? Now, in the metric system, it's 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But that doesn't mean anything to us. It's 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. That's seven and a half times around the surface of the Earth in a second. How long does it take light to get to us from the sun? Say it again, somebody. Eight minutes, 8.3. So if the sun blew up right now, we wouldn't know for eight minutes. Okay? Then we would say, oh, it blew up. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it would be bad. Um, and so E equals MC squared. Now notice this is a big number. So when we square this, 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. Who can do that in their head? What's 3 squared? Nine, okay. And what do you do when you square an exponent? When you square an exponent, come on. You multiply. Eight times two is sixteen. Come on, you learn that in math. You know how to do that. So nine times ten to the sixteenth. So it's going to equal the mass times nine times ten to the sixteenth. That is a very very big number. Because when you square, c squared, when you square an exponent, you multiply it. Okay? That's a huge number. So it only takes an itty bitty little bit of mass to create a big boom. And we're going to learn that the explosion in Hiroshima, the first bomb, the mass of the, the entire amount of, the, of what reacted was less than the weight of a dollar bill. Okay? Get created that big, humongous boom. And so uh, it's very, very tiny. So if something's not mass, matter, it's energy, but they are related. And as we go throughout this semester, we're going to talk about the relationship between energy and matter. On Monday, we're going to go, your labs are due on Monday, but on Monday, we're going to talk about something that's not in your notes, and it's going to be well, what causes a reaction to occur? Why do some things react and other things not react? And we're going to kind of look at that. It's going to be more of these energy changes, uh, and you're going to love it. It's something to look forward to. All right, y'all have a great weekend, and go Jags. I can't get